Okay, and the final talk for this session is from Julian Alvarado Gomez from Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Oh, all right, can you hear me? Yes, okay. Thank you so much, and I would like to thank the organizing uh, committee for giving me the opportunity to present our work here in this uh, very special conference. I'm going to be talking uh, here about the efforts that we've been doing to observe and model the space weather beyond the solar system. We had a great set of talks this morning that made my life much easier. Uh, so if, if you look at the abstract that I submitted for this talk, you will notice that I, I, I was talking about two different uh, particular applications of this topic, and I will dive directly into them. So the first one was about the suppression of coronal mass ejections in active stars. We heard a little bit about this uh, before my talk, so I don't really need to go into too much of the details behind this slide, but just to briefly remind you that in the sun we usually see that the very large flares, typically characterized by this GOES uh, scale, the X-class flares, are nearly always accompanied by a CME. So this poses immediately the question to active stars. This was already reviewed by a nice talk by Rachel. Uh, so basically, there, there were some studies that were trying to do this, taking the masses and the kinetic energies of the CME and see what, what, which were the consequences of extrapolating this to the activity levels we observe in other stars. The conclusions of those works made uh, they were a little bit uh, concerning in the fact that you reach very problema problematic consequences for this. So something must be happening for very large energy. You cannot keep going up in this, in this relation. That's the bottom line here. So one possibility to this is the suppression of CMEs by an overlying magnetic field. And this is a, an idea that's actually coming from solar observations. So in here I'm presenting you a very nice, probably for the solar audience, uh, active region, uh, 29, 2192 occurred in October 2014, is the largest active region in the last 28 years. It generated more than 100 flares, 32 M-class flares, 6 X-class flares, but only one CME. In that little tiny line that I can find my mouse here, this one here, a very tiny CME that, in principle, the explanation for this was this very strong dipolar-like magnetic field. You probably cannot read the line, but the, the, the little arrows there are saying that this is a field of 1,500 Gauss. So this very strong field probably was confining all the CMEs. So you get all the flares, but you don't get the CMEs. In stellar observations, we know for some, some years already uh, that the large-scale field of active stars are much stronger than the solar case. So this is a uh, I mean, famous confusion plot. I'm not going to talk about this here. But this is a stellar mass against rotation period. And the only important point of this plot right now is that every other point, which is not the sun, which is over here, is larger than the sun. So this means that more active stars have stronger fields. So those stronger fields possibly could give us the confining conditions. So how do we test this first? Well, we are going to do some data-driven numerical simulations. We're, gonna, we're becoming very good at them. So we're using the space weather modeling framework, a set of 3D MHD models that has been used for different heliophysics domain. I'm showing you here uh, one of the com model observation comparisons from the development of the code of the lower corona. And this is uh, uh, physics-based uh, um, simulations, which uh, assume alpha and wave heating as the source of the corona, of the hot corona, and the stellar wind expansion. And for running these, you need some information about the magnetic field distribution. So for the sun, we use the synoptic magnetograms. For stars, we use FDI. This is great. And we've been doing this to simulate the environment around sun-like stars, like in the left plot, or m and like in the right plot from the paper from Cecilia Garrafo. So we continue in this way. And then we need now another model to simulate the CME. And this uh, has been re very recently implemented into a space weather modeling framework. This particular model of Gibson and Law in 1998 of a twisted flux rope that is going to be the generator of your CME. Um, so basically, it's incorporated into the already uh, ongoing stellar wind solution. And this is from uh, Meng Jin's et al. work that this is the magnetogram they use. And this is some advertisement in NASA showing that we have now a model that can more or less reproduce what we observe in coronagraph images. So what we did was basically take all these parameters from the very nice calibration study done in the sun, but we apply it to a younger sun. So the large scale field of the sun in here is going to be much stronger, like 75 times stronger than the solar one. Uh, and then these are some of the simulation parameters that we did. It's not so much important. And after many, many cup, uh, cups of Colombian coffee and one million core hours of supercomputing time that I'm going to summarize here, 
these are some of the results. So we have confined CMEs. So this is how a little bit of the simulation setup. You have the surface of the star, this very nice dipolar field, 75 Gauss. You have your eruptic active region, which is more or less highlighted by these purple uh, lines. And this eruption, uh, I'm sorry, and it's not going to show here very well, but this is embedded into a stellar wind solution. So I'm only going to show you here the differences in the velocity with respect of the ambient wind. Because we were already thinking that the possibly the best way to try to look for a signature of this was in Doppler shifts. So this is what we had in mind when we were doing this. So this, it, it will have an equivalent GOES class flare associated with it for this event of an X5.0, uh, a strong flare, very strong flare. And you can see that as soon as the simulation starts, our CME basically goes nowhere and the, all this material is restricted to move along the field lines and is not leaving the lower layers of the corona. Um, this is basically what I just said. Uh, the same, uh, or a very similar event occurring in the sun will look like this, which you can recognize in my batch. So you will reach uh, several thousand kilometers per second CME using a similar setup in a normal solar condition. So, we went beyond the parameter space for solar CMEs, and then we actually have some partially confined CMEs and some monster CMEs, so very big ones. So this is a, an event. These are the properties of the CME that would have a very strong GOES class, above 100 in the X classification. And you can see that as soon as this event starts, actually manages to break out and go away. Uh, and we can go even higher in energies. And this is a monster flare, the X900 in the GOES classification. And then you see that actually this CME breaks in two parts when it's going up much faster than the one that is lower down. So if you look at these numbers and you r remind yourself a little bit of the solar values, you will see that the masses of the CMEs are much larger than, or are comparable, but very large compared to solar CMEs, but the, the speeds are relatively similar to what we observe in the solar case. So what we observe is actually that the large scale magnetic field slows down all the CMEs and makes them less energetic. And I, I, I was very happy to see the previous talk saying that they are, they are seeing this. Oh, I don't know what's happening here. Um, um, all right. So I'm just going to quickly to the final plot of this part. So basically what we are interested in is in, is in this suppression threshold. So you have here the kinetic energy of the CME and the poloidal flux. So you have some of the confined events, the escaping events, and so two historical events for the sun. You have some equivalence for flaring energies. And this is the solar parameter space. And we believe that somewhere around here, there's a suppression threshold for this particular configuration that we use. So the large scale field slows down all the CMEs. The escaping CMEs are less energetic than expected. And the candidate CME events that we have so far actually show this. You, you should look at my, Sophia's Marshall uh, poster. Uh, the magnetic suppression would mitigate all the low energy and, and small moderate CMEs, and only the very big ones will be able to escape. This is what we're working right now, trying to get large field complexity, observable signatures, and if there's any connection with super flares. All right, so this was very fast because I have a lot to talk about. So if you want to talk about more of this, please find me in the coffee break. I have the second topic to talk here, and it's the changing space weather of a young sun. So, and this is a massive project that we're running uh, because we know that what's controlling the space where is actually this, the magnetic cycle, the, the, the variability of the, of the magnetic field that we, we observe beautifully in the sun and is reflected everywhere, particularly in the X-rays, in the beautiful X-ray cycle obtained by SOHO, the HST of solar physics, I would say. And this, is, this actually translates all the way to the, to the boundary of the solar system in the heliosphere. Uh, so the question is, can we study all of this in another star? This is, this is what we're trying to do. And I will show you the efforts that we're doing to do this in this particular object. Iotorology, sun-like star, is a very young star, 600 million years old. This is the rotation period and has a beautiful activity cycle, a coronal activity cycle, which actually is the shortest X-ray cycle we know of. Um, so you will think that this is possibly a very nice candidate to do a monitoring program. Um, tell me that again back in 2015. Um, so we started in 2015, this far beyond the sun campaign, we decided to actually, we want to see how the magnetic field looks like for that star. So we started to observe the star with Harps pole. Uh, we have completed already 15 Zeeman Doppler imaging methods to actually see how the magnetic field on the surface looks like. And they're observing for us right now in, in La Silla. So we, have, we will have three more, 18 CFDI maps at the end. At the same time, Jorge Sanz Forcada was running an epic campaign. Um, with XMM Newton, that is where all these uh, red points here uh, come from, which is X-ray flux, 
The blue points are calcium HNK you can get from a normal spectra like HARPS. And very recently, we were awarded some time with HST because we also want to see at the very edge of, the, of this, this stellar system. So I will just tell you a few words about that later. So I will show you quickly the very main result of this campaign, but I, I urge you all the community to come talk with me. This is a very rich data set. We really want to get all your feedback of what else can we do with this. Uh, we have invested a lot of time in this and effort, so it would be great to get all the feedback from all of you. So this is how the, everything started. I'm showing you a, a Mercator projection ma magnetic field maps of the radial component. Everything that you see blue here is negative polarity. Everything that you see red is positive polarity. And you see that in December in 2015, the negative polarity was dominating the pole of the star. Then as time progresses, this just kept going. And at some point, you get this kind of mix and weakens the, the field and then some mixed polarity there. And then back in February 2017, the positive polarity took over, kept there. And now we are more or less in this situation. And if you look at the two maps that have been enclosed in this purple box, these two maps look identical for a set DI, from a set DI perspective. So from this, we really know that we completed the mapping of a magnetic cycle in the star. So I also encourage everyone here, when we talk about activity and magnetic cycles, to make the difference. Because a magnetic cycle requires this, of the polarity of the, the magnetic reversal polarity. An activity cycle can be seen in x-rays and proxies, but it's not exactly the same. And we see this here. The activity cycle that I mentioned of 1.6 year is not coincident with this particular time scale of roughly 2.4 years. So this is different in other stars as well. So as again, we can use this magnetic field information to actually simulate the entire space worm of the star. I think I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to show you here some of our wind simulations that actually en enclose all the way to three astronomical units. You can get there the inner edge of the habitable zone of the star, and then you get all the conditions for the wind, pressure, uh, and the characteristics that you get there from the density of the stellar wind. So, What's next? This is what we're trying to do. So you probably know this plot, and this is the mass loss rates that we know for all these uh, um, cool stars, basically. Work from by Brian uh, that showed this correlation of more active stars that is going to be in the right-hand side of this diagram uh, appear to have certain higher mass loss rate until a certain point and then drop to very low levels. So we have submitted a proposal that was accepted, and of course, iotology was there. And this is actually our prediction for the variability of the stellar wind. So we are trying to measure the variability of the stellar wind of a different star, because I have in my mind that the sun is not changing too much there, but there's probably a lot of change to the right-hand side. So that's it. I will leave you with my conclusion remark for the first part of the talk and for the second part of the talk. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to use the chair's prerogative and, and take the first question, if I may. Um, you said, it was, for the first part, there was yes. a work in progress to go towards more complex magnetic field structures. Um, do we have a sense of how magnetic field topology might play a role in the CME confinement? Um, this is a great question. So. Um, so we, we know a little bit about this from solar study. There was actually a, a nice paper from Mark De Rosa. He's not here anymore in this meeting. But basically, he was exploring another phase of this problem. So I'm trying to explore when the CME doesn't go away. right? So he was actually trying to see when it ma manages to go out. And he found that whenever you have an eruption that has some sort of access, whatever this means, this is possibly a distance or whatever, to an open field like region, it will probably be much easier. So as long as you have maybe the complexity, it might play a different role. So sometimes you can have like local confinement, but then if you have an open filler, you may be the CME will actually manage to escape from there. So it's very difficult to predict right now immediately, but that this is what we, we're, we will try to do with more simulations. Yeah. Adam Kowalski, University of Colorado, National Solar Observatory Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics. In October of 2014, there was an active region that had six X-class flares and no CMEs. Um, have you used the detailed magnetic topology of the sun at that time to test your models, calibrate your models? So I haven't. So what I did was basically, so we're doing it 
on stars right now. So I know that this particular example has caught a lot of the solar uh, community attention because of the properties it has. It was a very big active region. So, uh, but I know that th there are some people that is doing this, so particularly Meng Jing, uh, who is a person that is working a lot in CME simulations on the sun. Uh, but I haven't myself tried to do this. I think we have time for one more question there in the back. Very nice work. Uh, I'm Tom Rock from Space Science Institute in Boulder. Um, a question also to the, your first talk. Um, the simulations were MHD, uh, MHD, which means ideal, I presume? Or do you, and then my question is, uh, what do you expect for changes if you include non-ideal effects, which of course will be a more expensive simulation? Oh, yeah, um, this is a complicated question. So we, we, so we currently are trying to run the, the easiest or more computationally simple, uh, still very expensive uh, version of Awesome. So we're not completely include all the, the different possibilities of the, that the model can uh, give you. So for instance, to d distinguish between electron or ion temperature or, or other quantities. So I imagine that including all of those uh, will certainly probably reveal a lot of more physics that might be happening. But uh, on what we are right, right now trying is just kind of do this uh, close, let's say, close to reality proof of concept that all of these mechanisms can actually work and maybe get some sort of sense of what we could observe if we would ever observe the a confinement of a CME. So what would be the observable signatures? Could, be, could we detect dimming uh, in our stars? Or could we detect like a shock heating from the CME or something like that? So for the moment, we, 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 I don't know if this answers completely your question, but the, we are not aiming up to pursue that direction just because of the computational expense. OK, let's thank Julian again and all of the speakers for this morning's session.